Hello, it's Paul Beckwith again. So in this video, I'm talking, um, I'm going to continue my discussions on on the uh, jet streams. Of course, the, the, dress, the jet streams, the behavior in the past, the behavior now, and the expected behavior in the future is extremely important for determining um, how climate change will affect um, the weather patterns and weather systems and how we grow food and extreme weather events and basically overall society, you know, um, in the future, you know, as climate change accelerates. So you can think of the jet streams as basically a wall which separates high latitude northern regions from lower latitude um, regions. And of course, it's warm and warm and humid in low latitude regions in general. And it's cold and dry in high latitude regions. So the jet streams separate those two regions. Um, and they circle the, they circumvent the earth. And as the pole, as the Arctic in particular gets much warmer, therefore the temperature gradient relative to the equator decreases so the jet streams slow down and when they slow down they get much wavier it's so they're, they're the waves are in the north south direction so when you have a wave extending very very far north you get warm humid air underneath it so it carries warm air high up into colder generally colder latitude regions and when you get um you know the the troughs of these waves going far south then the cold, dry air from the Arctic can go very, very far south. So it disrupts the latitudinal, uh, the temperatures at different latitudes. It disrupts the way that storms move on the surface of the Earth. It disrupts the hydrological cycle. It disrupts everything, basically. Um, and, you know, how we grow food, how we, where we get water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's very, very important to understand, you know, a little bit about the jet streams and how, they, how they're very important for weather and climate and how they're changing under abrupt climate change. So thus, I'm doing this series of videos and Earth Null School is one of the best places to play around and see how the um, jet streams uh, move. So if you click on Earth, and you click on 250 millibar, which I'm on, and you're on winds in the atmosphere, then you're basically examining the uh, jet stream. So they're very wavy. There's pieces breaking off. But this is a good example of a trough here, a sharp trough, a ridge here. So if you've got warm, uh, moist air from lower latitudes, and it comes up it extends up this far. Think of the jet stream as a wall separating the two regions and the cold polar air comes down into this region. So this region here will be a lot warmer and hum more humid than this region here, which will be, be a lot colder and drier. And these, these waves, these ridges can go right up to the North Pole in the middle of the winter and they, the, the troughs can go very, very far south. In fact, they can go down to the equator and hook up and join with Southern Hemisphere jet stream. So I was talking about um, this article here called Jet Stream is Climate Change Causing More Blocking Weather Events. And so basically I'm going through this and, you know, the, the weather wilding or whiplashing from one extreme to the other can happen. So we in the UK, for example, they had the sunniest and fifth driest spring on record. So the jet stream, there'd be a ridge over the UK, so it had warm, dry air there. A few months earlier, they had the wettest February on record, so there would be a persistent trough um, over the UK, bringing, bringing low pressure, unsettled, rainy weather. Okay, so the pattern shifted, the jet stream shifted. So you went from the wettest February on record to the sunniest and fifth driest spring on record, described uh, by the chief executive of the Royal Meteorological Society 
as being an unprecedented situation. Okay, so in the spring, the jet stream buckled and shifted northward, allowing the high pressure to dominate the UK. These blocking patterns of high pressure are the main reason for the extended periods of sunny, dry, and relatively warm conditions that they've had in the spring. Now, Siberia, the usually chilly expanse of Siberia, has been simmering in unseasonable heat. And this has happened for most of 2020. Average temperatures in May were 10 degrees C above the norm, reigniting wildfires that were still simmering from last year, these zombie fires. Okay, again, this type of heat is the result of a blocking weather pattern. Okay, so you can see the heat wave here. So very strong ridge coming up here, bringing the, the hot, um, the hot uh, air right, right up into Siberia. Blocking is most common in spring, but it's often most associated with dramatic heat waves in summer and severe cold in winter. So in spring and fall, it's common, but it doesn't bring the weather extremes like it does in the summer and winter. So it's not um, such, such a big deal. People don't recognize that it's going on so much in the, in the shoulder seasons, in the spring and fall. Okay, but blocking was a driver in all of these events. The UK 1976 summer heat wave, the deadly European summer heat wave of 2003 that killed many, many people in Europe, uh, specifically in France. Siberia's heat waves and wildfires in 2013, Europe's cold winter in 2009-10. Okay, a blocking pattern also brought uh, the record warming March 2012 uh, heat to the US and a record breaking cold March in 2013. Blocking also affects the path of tropical cyclones, steering them onto unusual tracks. So that happened with Hurricane Sandy, for example. There was a blocking which impeded the, the, the uh, movement of Hurricane Sandy. So Sandy did a very, very unusual left turn and came, came ashore in New York and of, caused, and of course caused huge damage um, when it struck the US. There are certain regions where blocking preferentially occurs. So in the Northern Hemisphere, these are on the Northern and Eastern sides of the North Atlantic and North Pacific Oceans. So for the North Atlantic, that means over Greenland and Europe. Now, the frequency of blocking events has been studied, and I'll look at these papers in, in great detail, but the, I'm just summarizing the results here. Frequency of blocking events across the Northern Hemisphere um, over 1958 to 2012 was looked at over the winter and summer. And uh, there's a lot of variation um, between method, region, and season, but the number of uh, but typical numbers for blocking regions over Eurasia, the Atlantic, and Alaska would be one or two events per season, with each event lasting about a week on average. So here's, here's a figure. This is showing the blocking frequency um, in the Northern Hemisphere between 1958 to 2012, and it's the percentage of days in the seasons. So, you know, 2% of the days, which is about two blocked days per season. And it shows this is in the winter, December, January, February. You can see the regions where the blocking is highest. This is using um, three different methods, and it shows the regions here being higher. You know, there's, there's commonality between these. And this is blocking in the summer, June, July, August, in, in the various regions. Uh, but there's also blocking occurring in the Southern Hemisphere. But blocking is less persistent in the Southern Hemisphere because the westerly jets are stronger. So the jets can tear away at the blocking pattern, sort of go through it, push it aside. So the blocking does happen in the Southern Hemisphere. It affects Australia, like the think of the fires, the drought and fires, New Zealand and South America, but generally it's not as persistent in the Southern Hemisphere as it is in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. This is uh, some of the fire, this is a blocking event in the Soviet Union, in, or in, in Russia rather, near Moscow on August 4th, 2010. You know, record temperatures, record fires. 
So what causes it? What happens in the atmosphere for us to get these blocking patterns? There's several different mechanisms involved and the balance between these is different in different regions. But basically we've got these Rosby waves in the atmosphere. These are giant meanders in the jet stream that stretch across the mid latitudes. They're also known as planetary waves. So they're the natural phenomena that result form as a result of the rotation of the Earth and the heat difference, the warm equator, cold poles. They're a feature of rotating fluids. You see them in the oceans and on other planets like Jupiter and Saturn, for example. Blocking weather patterns can occur when these Rosby waves become amplified and or break. Amplified Rosby waves can be seen in a very wavy jet stream. This slows the, the should be the west to east progression of weather systems, typo here, making conditions more persistent and allowing huge blocks to form. So there's different types of blocks and I'll talk about the categorization in detail when I talk about this, the specific scientific peer-reviewed paper that's, that, that details it. But this is an example. This is the omega block. So the Greek letter omega here. We've got a low, a high, and a low here. Um, so this is a block, an omega block over the UK. So the weather would be very, very hot and dry here. And if this thing sticks around for several weeks, you know, persists, then you get the heat wave and drought, really dry conditions. Okay, so there's different types of blocks, um, but the key thing is that they disrupt the prevailing flow of the westerly winds, which typically bring in mild air during winter and cooler, fresher conditions in summer. So you get more extremes, okay? Um, so the Omega block in 2010, for example, was sitting over Russia for July and August. So Russia had its hottest summer in history. They they lost 40% of their grain crop. They didn't export. Um, many The temperatures were, the heat over Russia produced many days where the high temperature was greater than 40 Celsius. So Russia had a record warm summer. Moscow was averaged near 18, plus 18 and plus 16 C above normal for the months of July and August respectively. Massive heat wave. But the trough associated with that um, Omega block was over Pakistan and they had record rains there and record flooding. So this was Pakistan. So this is the same jet stream pattern, the same um, a block, um, only it was in the low pressure side, the trough of the block, while Moscow was in the ridge of the block. And you can see, so while Russia was baking, Pakistan uh, had uh, the monsoons were affected. There were heavy rains. P rainfall totals were 70% above average in July and 102% above average in August, flooding over much of the country. 18 million people affected, almost 2,000 deaths, 1.7 million houses damaged or destroyed. So how are these blocks changing with climate change? So that's a key factor. But the problem is, is there's no set definition of a block. Block comes in, come in various shapes and forms so that while meteorologists would all agree on what a cyclone is, there's often different views on whether a particular weather pattern can be classified as a block or not. Okay, so I'll talk in detail about a review paper on this by Woolings. He wrote a book called uh, Jet Streams, which I haven't got and haven't seen yet, haven't read. It just came out, I believe. But a major weakness in dynamical meteorology is that there's no comprehensive theory capturing the different processes that act at all stages of the blocking life cycle. The onset of these blocks, the maintenance, the feedbacks, what keeps them going, and the decay of the blocks, what clears them out eventually. So blocking is a bit sporadic. It's hard to predict with computer models. It's highly variable from year to year, from decade to decade. So there's no clear trends in, in the blocking, except maybe over Greenland. We often get summer blocks over Greenland um, that are happening um, more often than they would normally. So how is climate change? How will they change under climate change as the Arctic warms? Models predict that they'll decrease in the future, but this is really sort of up in the air. So I'm going to talk about the scientific papers behind this now, so please stay tuned. Thanks for listening.